Yes. Okay, so uh, we will finish the uh, processes topic of our operating systems class today. Uh, and um, so to that end, I need to share the screen. Let's begin that way. Entire screen can be shared. Uh, okay, so as you might notice, I am putting the recordings on my YouTube channel. So it is getting accumulated there. So let me just show that real quick. Uh, from here, we, you should bookmark this page or something because sometimes I forget to announce new editions. So in this playlist, in this address, uh, we will put stuff as we proceed. And today I will add the processes IPC, inter-process communication topic, uh, which is this recording uh, here. So that should be noticed. And uh, as a fun fact, one, once we are here, maybe we should uh, begin with this observation here. Some of your friends may debut the clock. We can share it here. Uh, he came for us, but stayed for uh, Soat apparently, which is a nice, uh, actually not very nice because it is uh, depromoting our OS stuff, but still uh, we have this drumming going on. You are also welcome to observe that. Uh, yeah, so that was that comment. And you can come in and uh, get the new videos here. And in our process uh, journey, uh, we have covered the basics of uh, the general process concept, the context switch that issues. Uh, and uh, in, important deal was this fork business in Unix. Uh, that is the system call that enables us to create new processes. Uh, and we, we have uh, implemented some basic uh, uh, fork applications. Actually, one of them is here. Uh, so let's quickly remember the fork business anyway, uh, be because this will be also in your homework that is going to be posted tonight. So I am preparing a homework for a programming assignment. Uh, that is basically from the parent process, you will fork children processes and each children process will sort a given sequence of numbers and then it will send it uh, so uh, then uh, using process communication you will get those results and merge them into one file so it will be clear in the assignment document that is coming to today so th that's why be careful with all the implementation tricks that i am giving today and also watch the previous video uh, to do good in this assignment. Uh, so in fork, interesting part of fork is this returns twice, okay? It returns zero uh, to the child process. So the return value is held in this process ID variable and it returns the process ID of child to the uh, parent process. So this is where the parent comes in. This is where the child comes in. Uh, and so they both have the same code, but uh, interestingly, children and child will only execute this part of this code and also this part. Uh, it will never come here because this is in the else. So similarly, parent also has the same code, but it executes only the non-if part, which is basically this part, this part, and may above as well. Uh, so this is the big difference you should keep in mind. Uh, and also, since we have two, so when I fork stuff, here is the figure. Uh, so you have some, uh, each process has some uh, memory presence, okay? In that memory, we keep the instructions of this process, obviously, it is the code that will go to the CPU. We keep the global variables, we keep the call stack, uh, etc. So we have, uh, maybe I can draw it here real quick. 
we have this address space for the uh, parent, which has two and one in it initially, and maybe other things. And here is the code part, uh, instructions part. And when you fork, you create the exact address uh, space, exact size, because the content is the copy, so exact everything is the same, but physically it is at a different location. So this is at one location, this is at a second location, this is child, this is parent. And when you update the copy here, it won't affect anything here. Okay, so this is what we basically demonstrated in this example. When I update the uh, copy, which has A in both child and parent, when I update it from child side, it won't affect parent side. So we have also executed this program. So let's also set up that environment as we will use it frequently today. Uh, so I can maybe also increase the font size of this terminal uh, real quick. Uh, font size uh, 24. Okay. Okay, but why isn't this applied? So should I... Why isn't this big now? Should I open a new one? Yes, some uh, unlucky start to the class. So I, I thought that I have updated the size here and it is 24 now. Uh, so why isn't this visible? Uh, exit. And maybe if I maybe if I run this again terminal uh, okay yeah weird but true uh, so this is uh, I should go to my code folder and here I compile it GCC is the C compiler that we will use the name of my program is croc 1.c and I want the output to have the name still croc 1 and I don't want to see any warnings okay in case there are any so when I compile this and to run this in Unix, as you know, we first do this dash slash uh, dot slash followed by the name of the executable, which is proc1. So here, so what is happening here? Let's remember, I am sleeping the parent for 10 seconds. Okay, so this is the child it talked about and then it reached here and it printed 222 and uh, so execution scheduler gives parent the execution time, but since parent is still sleeping, it just releases the CPU and someone else comes in. And eventually when this is waken up uh, and the, its turn comes, uh, parent also speaks and it speaks too, because this 222 update in child doesn't uh, uh, affect the two here. So if you obviously set A to, 33 here, then the parent will uh, definitely see that because it is the parent itself who is making that update. So now uh, parent is, I am waiting for 10 seconds. So I think it's eight, nine and 10. Okay, so parent also reaches here. <clears throat> if you don't want child to reach here, okay, then you can exit it like with zero. Uh, then everyone, not everyone, only parent will reach here, okay? Because uh, child, as you can see, it executed, it has printed its process ID, etc., using get PID command, uh, and but it couldn't reach only parent, and only parent has reached here, so we haven't seen any 222 prints here. We have seen 33, which is due to the parent. So this is how fork basically works. This is the fork at its simplest form. Uh, and today we will continue with, uh, so I have dealt with these issues. We have solved problems here. You, we have attended to this video, etc. Uh, now let's talk about some uh, 
waiting issues. So parent process may wait for a child to terminate. Okay, so uh, because scheduler gives these uh, permissions arbitrarily, right? So uh, parent may get the permission first. So it may want to continue, but if it uses a wait statement, wait system call, then it just blocks there. It waits for the children to terminate, and then it escapes from the wait comment. And so this wait directly waits for the children. And you can also provide a specific PID, uh, then you can wait for that PID. So this is just uh, a version of wait. So this is one thing. Uh, second thing to observe is parent process may terminate uh, or kill a child process uh, because it knows child's PID after work. So it can send a signal, kill signal. So we will also deal with that signal today. Uh, so now I have these co configurations. Parent process terminates. In some systems, when parent terminates, uh, we also terminate all the children, which is not the case in Unix, in Linux. Uh, so in Linux, what we do is we just say that, okay, children, they became orphan uh, and they continue their execution. Then comes the zombie process concept. So what is this zombie process? Uh, Basically, it is a process that has completed its execution, that has terminated, but still has an entry in, in the kernel memory. So let me draw something to uh, depict this. Uh, so I have this process. It has some memory in the physical memory, not the kernel memory. So let the kernel memory be below this line, OK? So this is the kernel memory, K. So when I start this process, it's as I mentioned before, it has some instructions, some data, some stack, etc. Uh, it has the address space. It also has a PCB, process control block, block in the kernel, okay, where I keep the ID of this, etc. So assume that I have another, I have this process. It also has its own PCB, process control block. So when this uh, child, so this is the parent, and this is the child. Initially, everything is same within here, uh, but it is not the topic now. Uh, when the child terminates, basically, this memory is gone and child is out of our lives. However, this entry still stays here. Why? Because when this child terminates with an exit code, so everything terminates with an exit code to uh, define abnormal or normal termination. If you don't do exit call, it is by default normal termination, which is zero. Okay, so, but you can also provide your exit call here, like minus one or something. So this exit status is here. So let's say it is 10, then I have this 10 status here in the PCB. So then this process is a zombie process because it is dead, terminated. However, it still lives somehow in some sense. It is still in my system. Especially, it is in the kernel part of my system. So I keep this because parent may want to learn the exit status of, of its children. Okay, Be because if it learns that the children uh, exited abnormally, then it may take some additional action. Or, or if it it it, it knows that uh, child has uh, terminated peacefully, then it's it is relaxed, it knows that child has completed its task, so it can continue, etc. So now let's read here. Uh, okay, PCB has a member like depicting the exit code. Uh, this entry is needed to allow the parent process to read its child's exit status. Okay. And so when so how do I read it by the way? Uh, I read the exit status using that wait system call I just mentioned. Remember, wait has kept the parent waiting until the child dies or terminates. And when it terminates, this wait call not only unblocks the parent, but it also uh, learns the exit code of the child. Okay, so after wait is executed, now I learned my 10 here. So uh, 
Now this entry is reaped. Okay, so this is called reaping. Now this term, what is reaping? Reaping is uh, the zone removal of the zombie entry from the kernel memory, from the process table part of the kernel memory. Okay, so what if parent forgets to wait or doesn't wait? In that case, it doesn't reap, right? Uh, so eventually, the child will be re reaped by the init process. Remember, this is the first process with ID1 in Unix systems. So uh, it means that these entries will not occupy, the, the zombie parts will not overflow your kernel memory. Don't worry, eventually, at some time, uh, init process will kill them anyway. So don't worry if you forget the wait call. That's why. So, okay, when does the parent not reap? Uh, so I have discussed this. If I forget to call wait, then no reaping is done. But don't panic because init process does the reaping eventually. There is also another scenario. Uh, parent terminates before child. So this can never happen if you are using wait call. So basically these are the same things, right? Uh, if you are using the wait call, then this doesn't happen. Uh, uh, but you may do some exit before the wait statement. So somehow parent terminates before the child. In that case, there is no one to reape. Uh, so then again, init process will handle that. Okay, so let me show you some code here that will hopefully uh, keep everything in good shape for you. Uh, so here, what we handle is uh, 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 wait, so I am introducing you the wait call, okay, so in this function, I fork, okay, as usual. When I fork, uh, it returns twice. It returns zero to the child, hello from child, and it returns non-zero to the parent, hello from parent. So now, be careful. Assume that operating system has scheduler, has given permission to the parent first. So it prints HP, and then it comes to wait, but it uh, blocks here you can't proceed because you wait for the child to terminate. And as I mentioned before, you can read the uh, exit status of your child using this call by reference action. So, uh, okay, then uh, HP, you will wait here. So notice that this is an infeasible output. After HP, it is impossible to see a CT this print because you must go here, and when you go here, you will print HC here. So this is the second column happening. Okay, I am here. Then I exit, so I peacefully exit as my child. So that's why there will it won't print by. When it exits, eventually when the scheduler gives permission to parent, parent plus tells that, okay, child has terminated CT, and it says by. So this is possible. This is also possible. So what is happening here? Uh, scheduler begins with the child, okay. Then uh, it uh, exits, or even after this semicolon, you can just come here with your HP. Uh, so parent speaks, and then eventually child exits when you hit here. So wait is escaped and you print CT and then you print by, okay? So this example uh, is clear, hopefully. Next example is going to do uh, wait uh, of many process wait for many processes. Okay, so in this case, I will fork a lot. I will fork n times. Uh, so and the zero part will return will uh, be for the child. So child, it will do some stuff. I don't even write it. So maybe it is just sleeping. 
but eventually it terminates okay so this is the exit call with some weird exit codes okay it's terminating with that uh, so what is the parent doing uh, so i don't put any if else if fork is equal to non-zero here because child uh, exits anyway so only the parent parent process uh, will come here so the parent process will do and many iterations it will wait for any child notice that it has n child and children it will wait for any of them i don't provide a specific child id in the next example i will also provide that id but currently let's keep things very simple so assume that n is 10 okay and the seventh process has finished first okay so scheduler has given the seventh process some privilege or something or it is sleep time is small so you get rid of the seventh process so you wait is escaped uh, in when i is zero uh, but it escapes for the seventh process so wpid will be seven or i don't know the pid of the seventh process but let's assume it is seven so i will print child seven is terminated with exit status of whatever this is okay and by the way if the exit status is none uh, is negative or something it is negative then it says abnormal termination so do, do you understand the flow here so seven after the i process seven so i is zero now i is one i come here but i wait again i wait i don't know for the process four to terminate and when four is terminated wpid will be four and it has the exit status of 104 right because everything is returning an exit status based on their id and in the next example i will just uh, wait for a specific pid okay uh, and uh, it will help me print uh, or terminate uh, in reverse order okay uh, so what do i mean by this so assume again i have 10 processes 0 1 2 3 up to 9 or let's yeah, yeah up to 9 uh, so here i begins from uh, 8 to zero, 9 to 0 because n is 10 9 to 0 so it specifically waits for the ninth process to die okay so for instance assume that the process id 4 terminates first because the stuff of it is uh, the sleep time for 4 is less or i don't know the scheduler has uh, preferred 4 a lot something happens so 4 has died so i come here uh, i am still here by the way but the pid of 4 isn't equal to the pid of 9 so this wait pid doesn't unblock it still blocks because it waits specifically for the nine and eventually when nine comes dies i will escape from here and exit status will be 109 it will print 109 here and it will print nine here as the wpid so this is something you will uh, be using in your assignment as well that's why these two slides you should uh, definitely understand them uh, properly now i will show you one new thing uh, exec lp so what is it any process including the child process may load a totally different program into its memory space okay so what do i mean by this again let's go visual uh, so i have the memory space let's draw it here memory space for parent and the same memory space is duplicated for the child but this is at a different address so i have two things in my ram now when i uh, do exec system call here in the child process the entire program code so notice that initially this code and this code is the same but when i execute a different process like ls which is for printing for uh, files in your folder then all this uh, space 
uh, is replaced with the space of your LS. Maybe it will be bigger, right? Because it's a new process. Maybe smaller, I don't know. But uh, the ID of this process is still the same. If it was parent was eight and client was six before, now still LS has the ID of six, but the memory uh, placement of six is totally different because now I have a totally different set of instructions because I am doing a different program now, LS. Okay, so replaces the entire program code of the process with the program code, new program code of a different program. New programs are started, like here, by forking an existing process. So, okay, I have a P parent, I forked here. So let's do it again. I am parent, I forked, I created a new memory for me with ID 6 and the process ID is 8 here. And then executing in this within this uh, child, if I execute exec LP statement, uh, then this memory space will be belong to a different one. So it will be replaced, but the ID will still be six. So uh, you don't fork a new process, rather it replaces the address space and uh, everything basically is replaced loads the new address space from the executable file ls and starts the execution from main, okay? When executable finishes, okay, so I am here, finished, it doesn't return to child, uh, return to the calling process p, okay? So this was p6, and so this is not parent, this is just p for some process. So when executable finishes, it doesn't return to the p because there is no p. If you look carefully, I have replaced all the P, so it is not in my life anymore. So you don't go back to P. Uh, and also don't worry, P is re uh, so it can't be a zombie. There is no uh, entry for P in uh, the kernel memory uh, uh, because it is replaced by uh, the new program, LS. So this is important. To start a new program, like how they do in Unix, is this way. For instance, you start your shell terminal application process, then shell is a process and it forks. Okay, so shell is this process, it forks, it gets another memory, and then within that it executes Chrome, for instance, or it executes LS. So this is how you create a new, uh, a new uh, program in a Unix system. That's why this is very important. Basic, the fork is the heart of uh, everything in Unix. Without fork, you can't create a new process. You will only see the init process, which totally sucks. Uh, and by the way, if you don't like to do fork and exec combo, if you are are afraid of that type of programming, don't worry. There is this call called system. So here I show you that. Uh, so this is a system call, name is also system. Uh, in Within here, you provide the executable name. So I was using LS here, but in this example, I am just using this executable, which is GCC. Basically, I'm compiling it. So this process, okay, this process creates any process called GCC and it compiles and then I create another process uh, and this is for running. So, okay, so this is GCC process because it has executed that command and this is A process, A dot out. And again, let's observe something. Uh, when the executable function, exec function finishes here, it doesn't return back here. Otherwise, it will be very messy, right? So this finished, uh, it would also, uh, that uh, GCC will also try to execute this, but no, you don't return here back. Uh, okay, here I am showing you an executable uh, uh, in, in action. Uh, so what I do here is I fork, so it returns zero. So if zero, don't enter. Basically, this is the parent part, right? Uh, shortcut happened here. 
So if you are the client, by the way, if executable, if the process scheduler gives permission to parent process, it will block immediately because I will wait for a children to terminate, which is here, but it hasn't terminated yet with 42. So eventually RV will be 42. Okay, Hocam, uh, uh, how, I mean, how the parent knows, okay, when the wait is called, the parent is suspended. Okay, but yes. how the parent is how the parent is activated again? The OS is activating, or I mean, how it knows very when it should activate again? Yeah, good question. Actually, uh, when the child finishes, uh, terminates operating system, who is keeping track of every process, may give a signal here, so it may uh, uh, it may. Uh, it will tell the parent process to run. So in the high level, the answer is the scheduler. So process scheduler eventually puts this process back into CPU. And uh, so, uh, and these actions happen very frequently. So eventually when it comes with its turn, the wait function will now return. So the infinite while loop within the wait function, think it that way, will just break and uh, it will be able to continue. So actually you don't, child doesn't have to do anything, parent doesn't have to do anything. Scheduler will put parent in action again later. And when parent is in action, it uh, due to the process control blocks, the states in the kernel memory, this will just escape. <laughs> So, okay, in the background, the scheduler operating system returns the function and because the function returns, the program continues. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, and uh, what the argument RV does in the wait function? Huh. RV is uh, going to learn the exit code of uh, the weighted process, which is the child, okay? Because, so, in this example, I am not doing anything further with RV, but, for instance, if RV is equal to 42, do something else, you can put it here. So, basically, this is a way to communicate between child and parent. So, child tells that I have finished with this exit code. So, RV can be important. In this example, it is not important, but uh, it, as I mentioned before, uh, it can warn parent about something, like, I didn't terminate peacefully, so do something, maybe rerun me, re-execute me, etc. So uh, it is oh, all okay. And okay, so RV is returned from the child process, right? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there, uh, there is... Uh, RV, so child process writes its exit code to the kernel memory, uh, to its process control block, and this wait call in the parent was always looking at that process control block uh, frequent. Mm -hmm. So it was just testing there. And eventually when that process control block entry uh, is uh, something uh, else, so it reads that entry now and RV is that value now. Mm, okay, so OS writes the, the RV from the process control block, yeah. okay. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. okay. right. So in this example, uh, in the child, I am just creating, I will pr create the echo program, which is uh, basically used to print something. Okay, so in Unix terminal, so basically if you say echo, uh, uh, echo hider, then this will print hider to the screen. Okay, it's as simple as that. Uh, so, uh, I created my arguments, it will print uh, some random string using this function. Uh, and after echo finishes, whatever exit code it has, it is now in the process control block and it is read by the parent process to the RV. So notice that uh, child process should never reach here because as I told you before, once you go to exec, when exec echo finishes here, you don't come back here because it is now a totally different memory space. It is replaced. 
So this will never happen. Here are more examples. Uh, initially, init with process ID1 is your uh, starting process. In this example, it has created two terminals or maybe more. And within each terminal, I create uh, like LS program, echo program, Safari program, etc. And by the way, as a quick detour, uh, here is my Java code uh, from my Windows platform to create two new processes. So this is, uh, you will call exec system call in Java environment. It will execute this PowerPoint file, uh, PowerPoint program, uh, which is in the same folder. And it will also create this notepad application, open it, like execute it. So this is how you do it in Java. It is rather simpler, right? But still, we, we will stack, we get, we will continue with the C in Unix. Uh, okay, now uh, I can continue with the communication. So we have already established some communication between parent and child, right? But this is all about exit in the exit scenario. Now I will communicate anytime I want with this IPC model. Uh, so a process can be uh, independent, like standalone. It doesn't interact with any other process or it can be cooperating because it is in communication with other processes. By definition, they are all standalone, isolated. They have their own address spaces, own resources, etc. But uh, depending on your application, they may need to communicate. So consider a web server process and the web client process, okay? Which is your browser, web client slash browser. So web server, uh, sorry, web browser, Google Chrome is a process. It uh, requests some web page from the ser server. So basically this talks with this server process and when server process reads that page from the disk of the server, it will put it in HTML format uh, or whatever format you need. Then it will send it back to this process. So there is a back and forth communication between these two processes that is used for information sharing. Another motivation can be speed up. So assume that you have a process that has some CPU actions, CPU bound, and also IO actions, IO bound. So if some IO like input, keyboard input is required, then the CPU instructions below it cannot continue because I just get stuck here. So, but some of these instructions, they don't require that input, okay? So the ones require it must stop obviously, but some of them may still survive. Uh, so if you create two processes and one can, uh, do this and the other can do this and they can communicate between each other uh, so they proceed faster. So there are two models we will see, uh, shared memory model and message passing model. In the shared memory model, we have this uh, memory uh, in the user space uh, and processes read and write through that memory. Actually, I have a visual of this here anyway. So process A and process B. So from the address space of B, I reserve some space to be shared, okay? So this doesn't have to belong to B. It can also be in the address space of A, or it can also be in anywhere here. Uh, but usually we, the operating system, occupies this space from the address space of one of the processes like B. So you call with the, you talk with the kernel uh, only during the segmentation setup. Okay, this segment setup. So kernel, uh, you request that I need a shared memory. So kernel then uh, gives this memory, arranges it and provides an ID for this and then processes they attach to this shared memory. And for instance, A writes something, 
and B reads it from here. So these are not system calls. These are basically uh, regular user level functions. Uh, so it is fast in that way because you don't really talk with kernel. Talking with kernel means that putting kernel in CPU, right? Because kernel needs to do some action. So these, uh, this is not that expensive. In the message passing, however, for any message you send, you actually send it to kernel. Okay, so you make a system call. Remember, system call is a call where you interact with the kernel. Uh, so in this case, what you do is you create your message, you send it to the kernel, kernel keeps it in a mailbox or in a message queue. Uh, and later, when process B wants to read it, uh, since they established the same mailbox ID, it goes, makes a receive call, it will go to the kernel again, and it will read that information from that mailbox. Okay, so this is, uh, more s slower because there are for every send and receive you are doing system calls here you do system calls only once during the initialization so this is the advantage of shared memory how about the other direction the advantage of message passing is that you don't need any synchronization so these processes they don't need to be coordinated what do I mean by this uh, so later we will see it in detail, but whenever you share a space uh, between two or more processes, there are some race conditions, which is what? Which is the following. Uh, you have access to a global variable here or to a variable in the shared memory. And without finishing your business with that part of the block, uh, the scheduler may kick you out of the CPU and the other process now starts to work on that variable. So when A comes back to the CPU, it will just proceed with a different version of that variable. So these are very complicated things. They may get very ugly. Uh, and with the shared memory tactic, you have to design your own complicated synchronization mechanism. But with message passing, you don't have to do that. So this is the advantage of message passing because there is no synchronization. There is one message, it has gone. See, it is not touching process B. It is sitting here forever uh, and not forever. Uh, when the B receives it, you just receive it. So there is nothing to conflict here. So basically I am talking about them here uh, in message passing. So in shared memory, no system call. Uh, but synchronization is an issue in message passing. Uh, when you send something, you can block. So this looks like a postman uh, knocks on your door, like sends you data and waits, blocks until you receive it, until you open the door. And receive can also be made blocking, like you are in a restaurant uh, and you want to receive food. So you stop everything, don't make any conversations with your friend or date, and you wait until the waiter comes and you order food. And once you order food, you then do your dialogue. So it can be implemented this way. It can also be implemented in a non-blocking way where the postman, the sender, just leaves it and goes. Like you, uh, basically you send it to the operating system's kernel part, and then you continue because you know that the kernel memory will even will keep it in the mailbox here, for instance, and it will eventually deliver it. Okay, uh, and in the receive again for the restaurant analogy, you wait for the waiter like to receive something, but you don't really stick there. You don't block. You still continue your conversation. Uh, and so one process, shared memory. So now I will do some visual action here. Uh, one process creates the shared memory with the unique address key. Okay, in this case, process one does it. Uh, and kernel provides you the key. 
because you make a system call to kernel to get this memory uh, in somewhere in the user space. And then using that key, you can attach here. Also, two can attach here, three can, four can, five can, anyone can attach here. So uh, to be more exact, uh, you will get the memory using shame get. Uh, this is a system call. You can attach it using sh uh, shame attach, and you can detach from it. So this is the uh, calls from Sys5 API. Uh, there are there is also an alternative called POSIX API, which we will use for other uh, communicators like pipes. But here POSIX uh, Sys5 was an older API, so it is. They are both popular. Uh, POSIX is more uh, known for its thread uh, support. So for shared memory, uh, I can argue that uh, SIS5, System5 is a better IP, uh, API, simpler. So we will see the example in that API. Also, Windows can also provide shared memory stuff using Win32 API. So I will study this problem over a code. Uh, and I will do that when we return uh, from the 10 minutes of break. Okay, so uh, you can also create some questions in the break. So we will continue in the next uh, session. <laughs>